Hi, my name's Ed, I'm a junior doctor in the UK, and today we're gonna to be looking at the TV adaption of the hugely successful book, This Is Going To Hurt, Secret Diaries of a Junior Doctor, starring Ben Whishaw, all about the junior doctor years of Adam Kay. One of my first placements was on Obs and Gynae, the specialty that Adam Kay was a trainee in. So some shared experiences there too. Anyway, I'll be giving my thoughts on episode one, just to say I've covered shows on the BBC before, most notably the COVID episode of Casualty, and I've got loads of copyright claims, so we're gonna keep the cuts really short, so that's why I'm doing that. So. Let's just dive in. And also viewers discretion on this one because it's set on a labor ward. So we're going to see lots of babies being born and operations as well. Ready? Three, two, one. Ah! Ah! Breathing, nice deep breaths. We've got an emergency in this lift here. And this is the most mad lift I've ever seen. And I have heard of lifts like this. I'm sure people in the comments will vouch for it. I've thankfully, never had the pleasure of riding in one like this, particularly with a patient during an emergency. The equipment you see in hospitals is kind of ever changing, ever, you know, being updated, but the actual buildings and infrastructure are often kind of set in the past. They've definitely captured the junior doctor look, the messy hair, the bags under the eyes. Definitely something I can relate to. And replace the cord, get around to the theater. I'm gonna change into some scrubs. You consent her. Deep tissue massage. It's a cord yeah. prolapse. I like this. So showing some of the realities of the difficulties that can arise from obtaining consent. So Dr. Adam here should be the one obtaining the consent for the patient because he knows how to perform the procedure so he can explain what's going to happen and give a patient the best idea of the risks and benefits. The SHO here, although will be assisting in the cesarean section, shouldn't be asked to do consent, but can be put in these difficult situations. I mean, particularly here because it's time critical and Adam needs to get ready for the operation. Less Alton Towers, maybe. Why don't I draw? This is I know very dramatic, but definitely a thing. Having a midwife's or doctor's hand inside the vagina like this and being escorted to theater, there are indications for this. Fortunately, I've never witnessed it. But in a cord prolapse, the emergency we see here, the cord has come through the vagina first before the baby. And as the baby is also on its way out, the baby will be compressing that cord and so denying the baby its own blood supply. Therefore, you need to put your hand to push the baby back up inside the uterus to relieve the compression on the cord. Baby's heartbeat. <gasps> Welcome to the NHS. <laughs> So as opening sequences go, that was pretty bang on for realism. This is Obzangaini, also known as Brats and Twats. <laughs> People really just tend to stick to OBS and Guidey. So OBS stands for obstetrics to do with pregnancy and delivering babies, hence BRATS. And Gynae stands for gynecology, so medicine of the female reproductive system, hence BRATS and the other word. Vending machine system for scrubs. What the hell? I've never seen anything like that. Our scrubs just come out of a laundry cupboard. They seem to have credits as well, like... Uh, you know, it makes it sound like these were rationed for doctors. Why did you head back to where you were sitting? Morning, old trout. Morning, Ria. Morning, Dr. K. This type of thing makes me a little bit uneasy when we're dealing with shows that claim to be the diary of a junior doctor, so things that have actually happened. Outside of the emergency we've just seen, this is one of the first communications we see between someone in the NHS and a patient. Okay, it may have actually happened and you may have experiences yourself of this type of thing, but to me, showing this right off the bat only kind of normalizes this behavior. And I'm not saying I'm a saint, but we should be able to deal with a demanding patient without resorting to childish name calling. And I also don't think the patient here is being particularly demanding, but I think clearly they're setting this story up for something. Review Mrs. Buckstar, go to Starbucks. Which one is Mrs. Buckstar in? <laughs> wants you to get a fancy coffee without me knowing. Milk and one sugar for me, please. <laughs> it goes to show what I know. I actually thought there would be a patient on the Guiley Ward called 
Mrs. Buckstar. My first day as an Obs and Gynae SHO was exactly like this and you usually have an induction week on a new job where you do mandatory training and learn about the systems, although one doctor has to come away from that and be on call that week and that was me and so <laughs> I've just literally started the very first minute on Lave Awards. So if I'd have been asked to review Mrs. Buckstar, I would have jumped at the chance. I'm afraid I've got some bad news. You spelled pavilion wrong. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's a pretty funny joke, but a terrible way to start a patient encounter. This is the thing about this series and the book. I'm pretty sure most of this stuff didn't happen like this. It's clearly a dramatization. So something more akin to Scrubs, which was also based on the memoirs of a doctor. But yeah, it is nice to have little icebreakers when talking to a patient. I mean, my favorite at the moment is to apologize for the mask, the gloves and the gown and tell the patient that there's a funny bug going around and, and they may have heard of it. Okay, it's not as funny as this, but it's also not gonna get you into as much trouble though. Choose who does intimate examinations on me, are you? I'm saying you won't be choosing based on the color of their skin. Adam. What? Did anyone say anything about skin colour? Wow, okay. That escalated quickly. On shift last week, I had someone say that they were glad they had an English doctor when they saw me, despite me being the least experienced person on shift. So this type of attitude still going around, and I'm sure if you speak to anyone of colour, they will have lots of stories like this. Right, surprise me. What's the management? Oxygen flow through a normally breather mask. Um, check for a pulse. So near and yet so short. <laughs> Brilliant. You get used to being quizzed by your seniors and the SHO is doing a pretty good job. They're talking through an A to E assessment, which is absolutely the correct way to approach a patient like this. It's actually Dr. Adam here, the registrar, that's being uh, a little bit cheeky, really. The whole lifting someone's arm to see if they resist dropping it on their head. This is something you hear a lot about in medical school, but in reality, you don't use that much. Although I am ashamed to say I have used it once before to see if someone was having a genuine seizure, but in a much more controlled way, because if you do it exactly like we see here, then if you're wrong, you could end up busting the patient's nose or knocking a tooth out. Stay breathing, okay? That's it, that's it. You're doing brilliantly. Thanks. Just talking to the patient. <laughs> slowly, slowly. You're doing brilliant. This is, <laughs> this is ripped off of the uh, age-old medical meme. Relax, David. It's just a small surgery. Don't panic. My name's not David. I, I know. I'm David. We see a nice scene here. This looks like what my hospital would call the DAU, so the Day Assessment Unit. So for anyone after 18 weeks of pregnancy with issues, the vast majority of the work is in this setting is done by the midwives who do a phenomenal job. Anyone that's had a baby will know the skill and dedication that these midwives have. So remind me, how many weeks are you? Oh, God, I hate maths. I couldn't even tell you in months. Uh... Like, like 2,000 weeks? You're 25 weeks. Oh, you mean the baby. Mm. Okay, again, this may have actually happened. I can recall a mum who didn't know how to tell the time, so I have no reason to doubt this account. But we are making the patient the butt of the joke just because she isn't smart and talking to someone who is smart. And I don't mean to be like a killjoy about this, but in reality, these situations aren't funny. They are much more of an eye opener and you realize very quickly the need that people have in education and additional support. We then go on to see probably the most realistic C-section I've ever seen. I mean, this could literally be looking at an operation. So huge props to the production team. One of the main jobs for an SHO is assisting in C-sections. So you could be doing five to 10 a day. So you soon get the knack of what you should be helping out on pretty quickly. But no, get her off me. I'm not having a delivering my baby. Get her off me, stop touching it. Adolf's a good name. <laughs> Adolf's a good name. Oh my God, 
what have you done? The idea that he's done a poor job and ruined her tattoo because she is a racist, I think your natural reaction is she deserved it. But actually, when you think about it, that's a pretty sick way of treating a patient under your care. And so almost certainly it didn't happen like we see here, although it is framed as a diary, so you kind of believe the story, but it must be a dramatization. And it's probably a story that someone heard that happened to someone else, but actually didn't really happen to anyone. Because in reality, it would be pretty obvious to figure out what's happened. So you'd either be suspended or struck off as a doctor. Although as a piece of drama and comedy, that is pretty funny though. Who's the, who's the senior edge? Uh, I don't think you'd get here from Sydney in time. Well, do say if you've got something more important on. Um, no, 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 no. Um... No, I can do it. This extremely realistic. I've seen this exact thing happen. Just like this hospital where I work, there was only one registrar on labor ward. So if the reg coming in for the night shift cancels last minute, then they have no choice but to stay. What can you do? You can't leave labor ward without someone who's capable of performing C-sections. There's no SHO and the midwife in charge is Tracy. But well, she was working during the day. The other one, non-reassuring Tracy. <laughs> Okay, a little inside joke here that I'll let you in on. So one of the midwives is nicknamed non-reassuring trace, which is a term we use when a baby's CTG heart trace in pregnancy isn't what we want. So her name's Tracy and so she is also a non reassuring trace. Isn't that, isn't that funny when you have to explain it? Five weeks, first baby, blood pressure through the roof. Grade one cesarean section, get anaesthetics or anti-theatres now. Tell peds it's a 25 weeker with placental abruption. Okay, so another emergency C-section. This time placenta abruption. So the placenta is coming away from the inside of the uterus. So again, going to compromise blood supply to the baby. Even though the baby is only 25 weeks, so only just viable C-section is the only chance it has even though clearly being born this young comes with it a whole host of complications. So also why he's made a reference to making sure the paediatric team are aware of the gestation. We've now seen two category one C-sections in this episode, meaning there is immediate threat to life of mother or baby, but just to reassure most C-sections, even emergency ones on the labor ward aren't like this. They would be a category two, which we have a much more time over. And these are for things like labor that is progressing slowly or where there is a non-reassuring trace that we mentioned earlier. We also find out this patient has preeclampsia. So a multi-organ complication of the second half of pregnancy where you get high blood pressure, leaky blood vessels, headaches, kidney damage, and is also a risk factor for placenta abruption, so the complication we see here. So that's why we should have taken the patient's headache more seriously earlier, and preeclampsia can be easily diagnosed with basic observations, urine dip, and a blood test. Yeah, please. Tracy, will you call Mr Lockhart and ask him to come in, please? I called him before you started. Why did you do that? I didn't... Okay, so that is a lot of blood. And thank God for Tracy, the non-reassuring Trace, because her experience of anticipating the worst has paid off and saved this patient's life. We then see a scene where the consultant is asking the junior to amend the notes. Okay with the intention to save the junior some troubles, but it's still quite a damning depiction of the NHS having been a doctor for six years. I've never seen anything like this happen. But again, I have no reason to doubt that this doesn't happen. It just seems to me that we're picking out all the really tough and controversial sides of the NHS. This is certainly not a typical day. So there you have it. My thoughts on the first episode of This Is Going To Hurt. And I'm not sure if that was therapeutic for me or has given me <laughs> trauma because that was a pretty brutal look at the NHS. The overall tone was 
probably the best representation of the NHS I've seen. Clearly we have reality TV shows like 24 Hours in A&E and Super Hospital that is actually real, but they are sometimes a bit sugar-coated and only really pick the best bits of what we do. So although this is dramatized, it is picking out these darker moments, which obviously don't happen that often, but do happen. The sets looked perfect with the wards and the whiteboards and all the folders stacked everywhere. The operating theater scenes, the staff and how knackered they looked and the pacing of the day as well. So you go from this quite slow part of the day to suddenly an emergency. One thing I was a little bit concerned with that I mentioned during the review is the target of some of the jokes, but maybe that's my taste. I think I am hypersensitive to what I say about patients. It's too easy. Patients are often scared, in pain, in an area that they just don't understand. So it can be easy to say or do the wrong things. But anyway, I'm super excited to see where the rest of the series goes. And if you haven't checked it out already, it, the, all the series is up on BBC iPlayer at the moment. And yeah, if you want me to continue looking at it, let me know in the comments below. As always, thanks again for all the support on the channel. And if you've made it this far in the video, thank you very much. And why not give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I hope you're all well and I'll be back soon.